Welcome to The God Culture, where we urge you to challenge tradition as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We do not intend to be confrontational, but to compare what the Bible really says versus the traditions of men, which Jesus himself rebuked. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7, nine. After proving the year of 9 BC and the third Hebrew month of Sivan is the birth date of Yahushua Jesus, we will now uncover the day in which Yahushua Jesus was born. And this wasn't easy, but we hope that you will find this is put together in a well-structured way that makes sense. We got one comment which made a really good point. How on earth do we find the day in Scripture? Well, many have never viewed the year and month evidences in the manner in which we have compiled, and this video will be even more profound. However, this is the greatest of the three because when you realize what day this is, it will blow you away. The things that happened on this day in the most ancient of histories, wow, you're really going to be blown away by this and we're excited to bring this to you and see what you think. We are going to prove the origin and significance of this day goes all the way back to the very beginning. Yes, we mean the beginning, and we'll explain how and why. Wait till you see this. This isn't just about a birth date. It will identify much more than that. And you have likely never heard this before, not because it's new doctrine at all, but we are going to tie this to the oldest and most ancient of doctrines, and you'll see. Let's fall in love with the Word. Once again, quick review, John the Baptist was conceived following his father Zacharias' service in the temple in his course of Abia. This places John born in the ninth Hebrew month of Kislev, and Elizabeth was six months pregnant in the sixth month, at the same time that Mary conceived the Messiah in the sixth month. Messiah was born in the third Hebrew month of Sivan, basically May-June on the Roman calendar of 9 BC. Though there are theories out there for 3 BC especially, among others, we feel we also effectively disproved that Herod would have been alive by then. And so many elements have come together already. But now, this is going to be further evidenced by the significance of this day. So let's go for it. One of our viewers, and we thank them, sent us a video from a U.S. program in which Jonathan Kahn, a Messianic rabbi, and we don't mean to pick on him, but we are going to address a piece that he used here. That's all. We're not saying anything about him either way. Uh, he projected his theory. Well, everyone has a theory on this, but do they prove it is always the question. We already deal with his points, and we feel we already disproved this, but he brought something up that was fascinating, and we thought we would mention it. We had heard that there was something in the Dead Sea Scrolls that identified the birth of Yahushua Jesus, but in our previous research, we didn't find such. On screen, this is a screenshot of a clip that was used on this program. Regarding a Dead Sea Scroll fragment that was found, he only mentions here that it was a Dead Sea Scroll, but not where it came from. So we looked it up and confirmed this text is a fragment from Scroll A in the Dead Sea Scrolls. As it is a fragment, it is not complete, but it is telling, and more so than he had identified at that time. Let's read. When the sun, to display itself from the east and shine in the center of the sky at the base of the vault, from evening to morning, on the fourth of the week of the sons of Gamul in the first month of the year. 
Now, Rabbi Khan and others leap to the assumption this must refer to the temple destruction in 70 AD. No doubt it refers to the temple in some fashion, we'd agree, because the sons of Gamul have the 22nd course, just as Zacharias' family, Abia, had the 8th course. So, this is a temple service course, priestly course, so he, he's on the right track, sort of. He suggests if one can place the sons of Gamul in the temple at that time, we can take that back, and based on John's father, Zacharias, we can pinpoint the birth date of Yahusha, Jesus, based on the course of Abia. Actually, that is brilliant. We'd agree. Obviously, we agree this is good thinking. Except one thing. These are the only words on this fragment. Clearly, we agree this identifies a major event wrapped somehow around the temple when the priestly order of Gamul served in the temple. It stands to reason this has something to do with the temple, but does this fit anything that we can find? Well, we believe so, actually. So, let's go back to our priestly course chart because we can actually figure this out. See what you think. So, we're back to the priestly order schedule, which we showed you before, but this is a different year. This is between the years of 50 to 70 AD. Why? Because 70 AD was the year of the temple destruction. So, let's see if this fits. We, again, really appreciate the work of Kurt Simmons. He really put a lot of effort into this, and this fragment will serve as further confirmation as to whether he got it right. Yes, we will prove this. However, the fragment identified that this event occurred while the priests of Gamul served in the temple in the first month of the year, and on the fourth day specifically of that service. If you look this over well, you'll see in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, the sons of Gamul did not serve in the temple in or even near the first month. So, is our chart wrong? Well, remember, the fragment never said it was referring to the destruction of the temple. It doesn't say that. And there is a major problem with that thinking or challenge. The temple was destroyed according to history in August 70 AD. Not the first week of Nisan or Abib, the first month. These charts are in 25-year increments, though this one represents the last 20 years until the temple was destroyed, and the only time the sons of Gamul served in the temple during this entire period from 50 to 70 AD was in 55 AD. Now, we don't see a major event corresponding, so real quick, let's take a look at the other years within this general era and see if something fits, and you'll find this is very telling. Here's the chart we used last video covering 23 BC to 1 AD. In this span, Gamul only served in the temple the first month of the year in 18 BC. No ties we can find to any significant event. In 2 to 25 AD, they served in 7 AD, but again, no real ties to anything significant that we found. But this next one, oh, this next one is fascinating. But in 26 to 49 AD, the date the sons of Gamul served in the temple the first week of Nisan, to match the fragment, is Nisan 5 through 11 in what year? 31 AD. Does that date sound familiar? We mentioned in the last video that if Yahushua Jesus started his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, then he started in 28 AD, placing his death and resurrection in the first month 
of the year in 31 AD. Some think he ministered three and a half years, but they are counting an extra year as it's actually more like two and a half. How do we know? He started before the first Passover, not a full year, perhaps a half a year, roughly. And this is mentioned by John, and John mentions two other Passovers. But he was killed on Passover, meaning if it were a full three years or more, then it would have to be four Passovers, not three. So, three in this instance, because he died on the third Passover, means two years plus the time that he was baptized in the wilderness, etc., before that Passover, however long that was. It may have been six months, it might have been four. I mean, it's different people figured it out different ways. I don't know that it matters exactly. But what we do know is, is that third Passover was when he was crucified. We will provide a full video on his death coming Maybe not too soon, but we definitely will do it at some point because we've already uncovered so much. And that also is going to lead to great revelation. According to Leviticus 23.5, Passover begins in the evening of Nisan 14. The Bible identifies that Messiah entered Bethany close to Jerusalem six days before Passover, John 12.1. And that places it on the 8th of Nisan. And the next day, he entered Jerusalem, according to John 12.12. We are going to produce another video laying out the time frame of the Last Supper, his capture, death, resurrection, and ascension. And we are already starting to work on that research. But we have to touch on this now as we wish to prove out this calendar that we have been using. Could it be accurate, or really close at least? It certainly appears so thus far, but now we have an opportunity to test another date and see if it matches. The fourth day of the week in which Gamul priests served in the temple that year would be Nisan 8. That's the day Yahusha Jesus arrived in Bethany, So he wasn't captured or crucified yet. So what does that day have to do with the temple? Because that's the context of this fragment, right? Something happened in the temple or to the temple on that date. But what? Since both of these dates come from John 12, let's go back and look at the previous verses in chapter 11 and see if we find anything. We are going to read the end of John 11, starting with verses 43 through 45. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. This is before, so we can set this up in context. We're not there quite yet. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council. And where would they gather? Where did they serve? The temple. And said, What do we do? Or what do we? For this man does many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Well, isn't that a good thing? He is the Messiah, the Son of God, right? But they didn't see that. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. What's the first one? They're worried about losing, whether that be their positions or the temple itself. Hmm. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, 
and that the whole nation perish not. Caiaphas is recommending they kill the Messiah because why? We just saw it threatens their positions first and foremost. And this spoke he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then, from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Why? Because they didn't want him bringing the lost tribes back. That also threatens their power, still today, by the way. We'll unfold this more in another video, but right now, this may not seem like it, but this is a highly significant event that took place in the temple. Let's finish. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, see, he knew, but went thence unto a country near the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim. Funny, Ephraim is equated to the lost tribes, and he goes there right before his death. Hmm, that's just a neat thing, not going to deal with it here. And there continued with his disciples, and the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves, as they stood in the temple, What think ye, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment, that if any man knew where he was, Jesus, he should show it, that they might take him. So that's the end of chapter, and then it goes to chapter 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. See, this is after uh, Lazarus was raised. So, what happened in the temple specifically at that time? Well, it appears Yahushua, Jesus, had not entered Jerusalem yet, so that wasn't the event. It wasn't the cleansing of the temple. It it wasn't necessarily his resurrection and the veil splitting, perhaps. But it was the Pharisees convening a council and making a conscious decision to kill the Messiah, which appears to have happened on that day, the 8th of Sivan, the very one from the fragment. Now, here's the other option we are not afraid to explore. What if our calendar were very, very close, but off by one week? If one was to move the calendar forward by just one week, now what happens? Well, if we go back to Zacharias, he would have finished his priestly course on the 30th of Shiva, Sheba, returning home on the 1st of Adar. Dude, and this places the course of Gamul in the very week of the crucifixion rather than the week before. And what does that do? Well, the fourth day of their cycle would be the day in which the earth shook and the veil to the Holy of Holies in the temple was torn. This needs more work, but this is very likely. In either event, we can identify a significant event on that fourth day of Gamul in 31 AD. This further proves this chart to be very close to accurate, confirming the methodology used to find the month and even the year of the resurrection. So, let's identify the day Messiah was born, Some have asked or stated that it does not matter what day he was born for various reasons. But once you see the day, this question will answer itself. First, just a little background. 
Galatians 4, 1 through 5. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. See, this is a parable format from Paul. A child becomes governor in his appointed time. His father decides when that will be as it is an appointed time, not by chance. Even so, back to the scripture, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. When the fullness of time had come is a direct comparison to the parable of the appointed time of the son's ascension to the throne we read earlier. It is the same in the same context. Yahushua Jesus did not enter Mary's womb at a chance time, and there was no wonder as to when he would be born. His time was appointed. You will see what we mean. Also, who exactly was Messiah? This is one of my favorite scriptures, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John, John the Baptist. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Who is this word? It's Yahushua, Jesus, the Messiah. Did he just come to be at Mary's birthing him? No. He was since the beginning. He was with God, and He was God, and is. He was the Word in, and God said, And all things that were made were made with Him involved. Which is why Yahuwah God said, Let us make man in our image. He is the light of the world, literally. And He said so. As all things we see are made up of what? Light. Every man that comes into the world is made up of his light. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. He made it. The Word, Yahushua, Messiah. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, Yahuwah. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was now made flesh at the conception of Yahushua Jesus in the sixth month of 10 BC and birthed into the world in 9 BC in the third month, the Hebrew month of Sivan. Now, one more foundational scripture, and we're going to start pulling this together. And I saw heaven opened, Revelation 19 11 through 13. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew 
but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Read this in context, and you will see this is Messiah, the Word of God. So what day would be appointed in the third Hebrew month of Sivan for the Word to become flesh and dwell among us? This is where this gets interesting, and it's only the beginning. The month of Sivan has a feast day of Yahuwah God called Shavuot in Hebrew. It means weeks. It's known also as the Feast of Weeks in English and as Pentecost in Ancient Greek. You've heard that term. Is a Jewish holiday, actually Hebrew, that occurs on the sixth day of the Hebrew month of Sivan. Uh, not so fast. We're going to prove that date because we're not going to buy Wikipedia's definition on that. It may fall, nor the Pharisees for that matter. It may fall between the 14th of May and the 15th of June. Wait, this is Judaism's interpretation of that date. We will prove that's not the date. Shavuot has a double significance. It marks the all-important wheat harvest in the land of Israel, Exodus 34, 22, and it commemorates the anniversary of the day Yahuwah God gave the Torah to the entire nation of Israel assembled at Mount Sinai, although and association between the giving of the Torah, Matan Torah, and Shavuot is not explicit in the biblical text. Actually, We do agree with that. The feast that commemorates when the word came to the Israelites. Wow. Why are they not making the association, though, with the giving of the Torah here explicitly? They have the wrong day. That's why. But we'll clarify. However, this is missing far more than that. The giving of the Torah is not the origin of this date. And when you see what is, all I can say is, wow. First, where did this post and this date of Sivan 6 come from? The same who wish to confuse this entire event and topic in general, including the entire Bible for that matter. But that's okay. We'll unravel it and see if you agree. The Jerusalem Post says, and we cite the article below, we can trace the concept back to the claim in the Talmud, where Rabbi Eleazar ben Shemua of the 2nd century CE AD says that everyone knows that the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on Atzeret Shavuot. Well, I guess it's settled then. Everyone knows. But does the Bible say that? Hmm, let's see. And Rava of the 4th century worked out that the commandments were given on the sixth day of the third month, Sivan, the date designated by the Pharisees, by who? By the Pharisees for Shavuot. Now, wasn't there already a date designated? I mean, didn't Moses record a date? Actually, he did, but there's a calculation involved, and that's where the confusion comes in. We will try to clarify, and hopefully you'll agree with our findings. The Torah, however, does not name a date for the Ten Commandments. It states only that they were given in the third month. This is true. The Torah does not state a date for the giving of the Ten Commandments. However, there are other sources we can use and that are very helpful. Just as it does not mention a date for Shavuot, Actually, once again, that is right there in black and white print, plain English. You can see it for yourself, and we'll count through it. We'll show you exactly when it is. Saying only that it should be 50 days from the day after the Pesach, Sabbath. Pesach, Pesach, however you want to say it. The exact day, as is well known, is a matter of dispute between the early Jewish authorities. Well, When they say early Jewish authorities, let's be clear, they mean the Pharisees. There was no dispute over this for thousands of years until the Pharisees got involved, let's be clear. 
When one actually reads the Bible, they find that the giving of the entire Torah took place over many years in all. But at Mount Sinai, the law was given on tablets written by the very finger of Yahuwah God, and additional portions of the Torah, like the prehistory, was given to Moses during that time, in that 40-day period. But several events, and by the way, that's documented in the Book of Jubilees. We're not going to go there today, but you can find that. But several events in the Torah had not happened yet, and Moses would continue recording all of his life, and he even started writing before Sinai as he recorded the battle with the Amalekites before Sinai, as Yahuwah God told him to write it down so that Joshua would never forget. So any scholar that displays disbelief that Moses wrote the Torah needs to simply read the Bible, because the timeline is there and very credible. We actually sat down with this whole account and mapped it out from start to finish, but what we found is that first, the passage identified they entered the wilderness of Sinai in the month of Sivan. But it does not say the first day of Sivan, not in Exodus. So, any attempting to count from a date that is not defined becomes meaningless. You will find, however, that Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights after having gone up several days times. He actually delivered the Ten Commandments verbally before he went up for the 40-day cycle and before the golden calf incident. So, anyone claiming the Israelites didn't know better is missing what the passage says because they already had the Ten Commandments verbally before the tablets were inscribed by the finger of Yahuwah God. So, we are not going to go there in this video. Yahuwah God gave his Torah law to Moses on Mount Sinai, but this occurred in more than a 40-day period, and there is not detail in the account of exactly what day Moses received the tablets that we find, but we still can find this date. So, did the word come down to Mount Sinai in the month of Sivan? Yes, absolutely, indisputably, yes. But this encounter does not specify a date yet. Why? Because this is a link, but not the link for this day. We'll show you, but first, let's look at the Bible definition of the timing of Shavuot Pentecost, because it defines it exactly. And the only way one can arrive at Sivan 6 is to attempt to redefine its words, which are very clear. We'll read them to you, share our thoughts, see what you think. Leviticus 23, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord. Now, whenever you see the word Lord in capital, capital L, lowercase o-r-d, lower caps o-r-d, in the KJV, this is replacing the name of God with a generic name. It spells it out for us. The original is Y-H-W-H in Hebrew, which we pronounce phonetically as Yahuwah. And it was replaced around 7,000 times throughout the Bible. We just thought we'd spell that out while we had that on the screen. Which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, days of rest, no work, God's holidays. Even these are my feast. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Now, this is a weekly Sabbath. Some view it as Sunday. Some view it as Saturday. Some say it's on a different calendar altogether that does not match with any of today's calendars. There are a lot of opinions out there, but we will provide the facts. We will address this in another video. We don't have time to break it down here, but we will break it down. We will get to this. Ye shall do no work therein. 
It is the Sabbath of the Lord, Yahuwah, in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, Yahuwah, even holy convocations, Sabbaths, days of rest, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Here's the first one. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even, evening, is the Lord's Passover. Now, let's chart this so it makes sense. Why are we doing this? Because the date for Messiah's birth is in figuring this out correctly and not simply accepting the Pharisee date, which we will tell you now is wrong, according to the Bible. Bear with us as we are getting to the point, and when you see it and understand, all will become clear. This is a lot to unravel, but we all can. First, though, was this abolished by Yahushua Jesus? Didn't he come to establish a new covenant? Let's look at his words quickly. Matthew 5.17, these are the words of Yahushua Jesus. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, the Old Testament. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. This is where we are many times told that he fulfilled these feasts, therefore they no longer matter. Think about the way it is used, though. So we should go keep pagan festivals instead? Research that. Prove all things. But let's not stop there because he tells us when this is no longer important to him. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, letters, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. When does heaven and earth pass away? Some may say never, but actually the day of judgment. The firmament is rolled back as a scroll and heaven comes to earth, combining the two as one. So regardless of which view you hold, it's at least not until the day of judgment, which is also the day he fulfills all the feasts, but it still doesn't say he will stop them, does it? But this is one of those places in scripture you will rarely hear in sermons for obvious reasons. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these, uh, these least commandments and shall teach men so, uh-oh, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Ouch! Notice, though, this does not disqualify that person from salvation, but qualifies them as among the least in the kingdom. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven, but kicked out of any modern churches, mostly. (laughs) Anyway, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So who will not enter the kingdom? The Pharisees. Ouch. That's a topic worth exploration. So, do these feast days matter today? Yes, they do. And he was born on one of them and died on one of them, resurrected on one feast day, and was the first fruit offering among the dead another feast day. And the Holy Spirit arrived on a feast day as well. So... You answer the question for yourself. Do they matter? We believe so immensely. Why don't we know about them today? That's another video, but let's get back to the feasts of Yahuwah God and find the right day here because this is important and it will lead us to the birth date, which we will even confirm in the end. Here's a new chart we'll use to simplify. Passover begins on Nisan 14, basically March-April, but it moves on our calendar. 
but not the Hebrew. It's a stationary fixed date, and all of these are. This was also the day the lamb was sacrificed, the Passover lamb. And Messiah was also sacrificed that same day. Yet, many ignore that and celebrate Easter instead. We're not going to deal with that in this video. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord Yahuwah. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have an holy convocation. The first day is a day of rest. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. So the seventh day of unleavened bread is also a day of rest, a Sabbath. Holy convocation is a Sabbath. It is a holiday Sabbath or a double Sabbath for that week. And if it doesn't fall on the Sabbath, then it actually means there's two Sabbaths that particular week. That's the way that works. You shall do no servile work therein. So, let's add this to our chart. So, same month, Nisan, 15 through 21, with the 15th and the 21st being extra Sabbath days unless they fall on the Sabbath day. You'll see the importance of this in a minute. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, the promised land, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord Yahuwah to be accepted for you on the morrow, the next day. After the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. When? the day after the Sabbath. What Sabbath? This is where confusion begins. It's the second Sabbath of unleavened bread we just charted, and the one just mentioned in the previous verse. That's the last Sabbath mentioned. That's the Sabbath we're counting from. And ye shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil. One offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an inn. And Ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. When does the statute end? It says forever. Several different ways, in fact. <laughs> Everybody, forever. Okay, so, would this pass away in the New Covenant? There are no scriptures to support that, nor are there any for keeping new holidays added to this list. Any. Do we have to do all of this today? How about we start keeping the feast days first, and we'll cover them in this video, and later we can get into the details of each. Let's chart this first. The day after the second Sabbath of unleavened bread is Nisan 22. This is the date that we will use to find Yahusha's exact birth date, and now you'll see. And then we will confirm it other ways, and we will explain to you how significant this day is, because it goes way beyond what the Pharisees said earlier, way beyond. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, which one? This is the day of first fruits. We'll get there. From the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, when do we do that? The day after the second Sabbath of unleavened bread. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So, that's 49 days. 
even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days. So, we add a total of fifty days, but what is this day? It is the Feast of Weeks, or counting, known as Shavuot, or in Greek, Pentecost. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your inhabit or habitations two wave loaves of two tenth steels. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Notice this is Shavuot but it is tied to the first fruit offering at the beginning of the harvest, as that is what we are counting 50 days from, being the end of the harvest and the feast. It is tied to it, just as we saw in the article, this date has a double meaning. It is the feast of first fruits at the end of the harvest, which started 50 days earlier. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year and one young bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord, Yahuwah, with their meat offering and their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation, Sabbath day of rest, unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein, It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Didn't we hear that before? Did you know that was in there forever? So, when does forever pass away? So, maybe this will cause some of us to reconsider the value of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant because we could go on and on with Scripture, even all the way through to Revelation, in which Yahushua Jesus says we are to keep his commandments. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, because that's what this is, the harvest, thou shalt not make a clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Why? Because Yahuwah built in provisions for the poor that are being ignored today and recreated as hollow giving to organizations that many times give a minor percentage to the poor and keep the rest. Some churches do a great job of feeding the poor. Most do not. Back to the chart. Now, let us count in the year Messiah was born, 9 BC, and identify the exact day. Then, we offer the significance and firm this up, this date, with indisputable evidence. So, hang in there. What we have here in the center is the actual calendar for 9 BC. The Roman months are to the right and the Hebrew months to the left. We know we start counting the 50 days to find Shavuot Pentecost on the 22nd of Nisan, which is the first fruits offering of the Hebrew month. So 23 would be Next, we've counted it out on both sides, on both calendars. The end result is the birth date of Messiah is Sivan 133753 on the Hebrew calendar, and that equates to June 2nd, 9 BC on the Roman. Remember, this is a feast day of Yahuwah God, which follows his calendar, not the Roman one. So it changes each year on the Roman calendar but is always Sivan 13 on the Hebrew. So if you were born on June 2nd, 
You can claim this as the same day, but it really is not. Sorry. Now, wait a minute. Did we fully prove this? That Shavuot Pentecost is the day, the only day that Yahushua Jesus could have been born? Well, remember, it was an appointed day, but we are holding a reference back that is going to blow your mind, and we'll get to it. This day is far more significant, but while we have this chart up for the four of seven feast days, let's just take one more slide and add the other three for reference. We're not going to review the entire rest of the chapter, but we encourage you to do so because we really should know these things. So we uncovered in the first month, Passover begins on Nisan 14 and March April, unleavened bread on the 15th through the 21st, both Sabbaths. The first fruits offering the next day after the second Sabbath on Nisan 22. We counted from there 50 days and arrived at Shavuot Pentecost, the birth of Messiah on the third month, Sivan, the day 13. Those are the four spring feasts. Now, Leviticus continues with the fall feasts all in the seventh month, roughly September, October. The Feast of Trumpets on Tishri 1. The ninth and tenth is the Day of Atonement, a time of forgiveness. And the 15th through the 22nd is the Feast of Tabernacles, where the Israelites stay in booths or tents, tabernacles, commemorating the 40 years in the wilderness. Add to that the first thing mentioned in the passage, which is extremely important as well, the Sabbath day of rest every seventh day of every week. We will deal with this again in another video as well, as each of the feast days in more detail. But notice each of these events has the exact same expiration date on the end. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. That's pretty clear. This was not just something for Israelites by blood. This is for all of us. And what we are about to show you is really going to prove this and blow your mind. But why are we so convinced this is the day? Shavuot, Pentecost. Because this is the day. You'll see. It is the day, the day, that Noah renewed the covenant with Yahuwah God and mankind after the earth was dried. The earth was dry, according to Genesis, the second month on the 27th day of the month. And this is confirmed and further explained in the book of Jubilees, which we're now going to bring in. You may not have heard of this book. But we assure you, we have fully vetted and studied it in comparison with Genesis, and there is nothing harmful here. It greatly confirms Genesis with some additional detail. Look it up, and you will find scholars claim it was written in the 2nd century BC. But as with all of their dating, they can only date when a scroll is copied, not when the original was written, because that was the documented procedure, scribes would copy it over every so many years. Jubilees has remained in circulation all along as it was used in writings, even equating it to scripture and canon before the time of Yahushua Jesus. By many of the early church fathers in their writings, similarly after the time of Yahushua Jesus, using it as scripture. The Ethiopian church has included it in their canon of scripture since their beginning. So, is it inspired? Is it scripture? Well, those three groupings thought so, but that's been lost over time for us, especially in the Western world. It was translated into English 30 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, if someone says, well, that's a Dead Sea Scroll, well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. 65 of the 66 books of the modern Bible were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are good, not bad. 
and fragments were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, in fact, in the same scroll jar with Genesis, more than once, just the two books alone. The keeper of that library equated them as scripture, which is confirmed in their writings, including their use of the calendar, which was the one from Jubilees, not the Pharisee calendar. If anyone tells you this was written by a Pharisee, remind them it goes against Pharisee doctrine on several levels and could not have been written by a Pharisee because it even espouses a different calendar which rejects the Pharisee calendar, indisputably. Additionally, if they tell you it was dated at 100 BC, remind them it was a copy, not an original, as all Bible scrolls are, and that there are ancient place names, many of them in there, in the Book of Jubilees, which are dead to history and lost and a 2nd century B.C. Pharisee would have had more modern names for these places that readers would identify with. There is no validity to this characterization whatsoever. And in our original canon series, where we prove John the Baptist was more likely the keeper of this library in Qumran, and not the Essenes who never lived in Qumran, but much further south, which is well documented, and the doctrine does not fit the Essenes either, but it does fit John the Baptist. We'll explore all of those things in that series. Some may not know that 65 of the modern 66 books of the Bible were found in the Qumran Scrolls with the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch, and many others. That's the only place there were scrolls Also, not the entire Dead Sea. There was one other cave just barely south, and then the areas where the Essenes lived didn't have Dead Sea Scrolls. They had other writings that had nothing to do with the Torah or Bible. And among all of those scrolls found in the Dead Sea, the sixth most numerous found was the Book of Jubilees. So we feel extremely confident in using this book in support of Genesis as well as you will see it confirms what Genesis says. It will expound sometimes because it focuses, because of the name Jubilees, it focuses on dating some of these events. That's very critical. It's very important. And we even found it actually gives full, complete directions turn by turn to Noah's division of territories of the entire earth. I mean, all of it. And we cover that in our flood series. Uh, And we find the Garden of Eden. We cover that as well. And there it is, right there in the text. So, see, it also says, the earth dried on the 27th day of the second month, confirming Genesis. So, let's read it. And on the 27th, Thereof, we're in the second month, if you read back further, he opened the ark and sent forth from it beasts and cattle and birds and every moving thing. And on the new moon of the third month, wait a minute, we were in the second month on the 27th, but Noah waited until the new moon of the third month he went forth from the ark. Why? Ah, that's the key. And built an altar on that mountain. And he made atonement for the earth and took a kid, a goat, and made atonement by its blood for all the guilt of the earth. For everything that had been on it had been destroyed. Save those that were in the ark with Noah. Wait a minute. Noah let the animals loose. Notice he did not have to return them anywhere as Yahuwah God would lead them to their places on earth that were created for them, just as was the case when they left the Garden of Eden, this also explained in Jubilees. But why did Noah wait to leave the ark, though? No doubt he had a lot of cleanup to perform, but he was waiting for a specific day. 
what day? Shavuot, Pentecost. Why? It is the day of covenant renewal, and we're going to prove that. And we are not there yet, but we will prove it. For those that see new moon in this passage, and assume that denotes the first day of the month, we will be teaching on the calendar and the use of the word new moon, and we will address that, but not in this video. We do not believe, and we believe we can strongly, overwhelmingly prove that the first day of the month does not begin on the new moon. The lunar cycle is not the determination for Yahuwah God's calendar. The Pharisee calendar is not the calendar. So, let's move on. If you haven't seen it, we have started our flood series, which really breaks this down in Genesis, the story of the flood. And Noah and his sons swore that they would not eat any blood that was in any flesh. And he made a covenant before the Lord God forever throughout all the generations of the earth in this month. There it is again. How is it that these covenants can be forever and yet replaced with new ones? Adam had a covenant. Noah renewed that covenant. He didn't replace it. He renewed it. Now, the passage shifts back to the writer, Moses, who is writing this while on Mount Sinai. On this account he spake to thee, Moses, that thou shouldest make a covenant with the children of Israel in this month, which month? Sivan, the third Hebrew month. Upon the mountain with an oath, and that thou shouldest sprinkle blood upon them because of all the words of the covenant, which the Lord made with them forever. And this testimony is written concerning you, that you should observe it continually. Can this be more clear continually, forever, throughout your generations? We keep seeing that. So Moses and Israel's covenant, which started with Abraham, was based on Noah's covenant, which was based on Adam's covenant. Do you see a pattern here? Skipping forward a little in the flood story, he set his bow in the cloud, rainbow, for a sign of the eternal covenant. How long? Eternal. That there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it all the days of the earth. For this reason, it is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets. The what? So there are tablets in heaven recording these things as well? Yes. That they should celebrate the Feast of Weeks. What's that? Shavuot, Pentecost. One in this month, once a year, to renew the covenant every year. So what are you doing on Shavuot, Pentecost? You're renewing the covenant each year. Final proof is coming that ties this all together. But this means Yahushua's Jesus' birth on this same day, is about renewing the covenant, not replacing it with a new one, as it is based on the original covenant with Adam, renewed by Noah, renewed by Abraham, then by Moses and the Israelites, and renewed by Yahushua Jesus, whom we covered, made it clear he did not come to abolish the law covenant, but to fulfill, renew it. Read further, because now it gets really interesting. And this whole festival, Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, Pentecost, was celebrated in heaven from the day of creation. What? When was the very day of creation? Shavuot, Pentecost. Yes, the day of creation, Sivan 13. Till the days of Noah, 26 jubilees and five weeks of years, continuously from creation to Noah, yes. And Noah and his sons observed it for seven jubilees and one week of years, 
till the day of Noah's death. And from the day of Noah's death, his sons did away with it. Ah, it started to get lost with Noah's sons. Until the days of Abraham, and they ate blood. But Abraham observed it. Abraham observed Shavuot. I thought that was a a Jewish festival, right? No, it's not. Abraham observed it. Noah observed it. And heaven observed it from the day of creation. This is huge. Until the days of Abraham and they ate blood, but Abraham observed it in Isaac and Jacob and his children observed it. So it continued through Jacob and Jacob's children up to thy days. So all the way up until Moses. Until Moses' days of modern Israel in that era when this was being written. And in thy days the children of Israel forgot it until ye celebrated it anew on this mountain. What's Moses doing on Mount Sinai? He's celebrating Shavuot, Pentecost. So he did celebrate it on the mountain. But we're going to prove to you it's not the day that the rabbis were trying to claim. We'll explain. And we could continue this until the days of the birth of Messiah, who renewed it and continued until those generations forgot. No, the Pharisees did not preserve this as they celebrate the wrong thing on the wrong day to the wrong God, which is typical because they do not know Yahuwah God, which is why Bible geography is so far off and even the location of the temple they have in the wrong spot. That's a Roman fortress. It is not in the city of David where the temple is supposed to be. Until the days of you and me, when we renewed this covenant, keeping his holy days holy and preserving our relationship with Yahuwah God through his son Yahusha, born on this very day. But still not there yet. A little further. And do thou command the children of Israel to observe this festival, which one? Shavuot, Pentecost, in all their generations forever, for a commandment unto them. One day in the year in this month, Savan, they shall celebrate the festival. For it is the feast of weeks and the feast of first fruits. Ah, it's Shavuot Pentecost, which is the feast of first fruits. The first fruits offering takes place at the beginning of the harvest, and the feast, which is the feast of weeks, Shavuot Pentecost, and first fruits, happens 50 days later as we counted on Sivan 13. This feast is twofold. And of a double nature, according to what is written and engraved concerning it, celebrate uh, concerning it, celebrate it. For I have written in the book of the first law, in that which I have written for thee, that thou shouldest celebrate it in its season, one day in the year. And I explained to thee its sacrifices that the children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generations in this month, one day in every year. The book of Jubilees also tells the date Abraham made a covenant with Yahuwah God, and guess what? And in the fifth year of the fourth week of this Jubilee, in the third month, In the middle of the month, Abram celebrated the feast of the first fruits of the grain harvest. Remember, the first fruits offering is the first day of the harvest, but the feast of the first fruits takes place after the 50 day counting. It is Shavuot, Pentecost, the feast of weeks, or the feast of first fruits. Not the first fruits offering, the feast not the offering, the feast, which has a double meaning, Shavuot and feast of first fruits, 
are the same. This says the middle of the month, but it's not going to go against the Bible. The 13th is essentially the middle of the month. And he offered new offerings on the altar, the first fruits of the produce unto the Lord, an heifer and a goat and a sheep on the altar as a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord, their first fruit offerings and their drink offerings. He offered upon the altar with frankincense. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am God Almighty, approve thyself before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. So Abraham too made covenant with Yahuwah God on what day? Shavuot, Savan 13. It all ties. But let's firmly prove the date now. Now here is confirmation of our date of Sivan 13 for Shavuot Pentecost. We'll prove this over a few slides, but it's going to all come home now. Exodus tells us, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone, and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Now Jubilees clarifies this further. And it came to pass in the first year of the exodus of the children of Israel out of Egypt in the third month. So far, that's all right in Genesis as well. On the 16th day, there we go. Wait, that's not the 13th day, is it? That's okay. It's accurate. It's correct. And we will prove this is exactly as it should be of the month. That God spake to Moses saying, come up to me. On the mount, and I will give thee two tables of stone of the law and of the commandment, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Now, this says 16th, not the 13th, right? Why the disparity? This day is not identifying Shavuot, but Yahuwah God gave Moses the two tablets of stone on the 16th. And that's where the Pharisees go wrong because they're trying to identify that day and connect it to Shavuot. Well, it is connected. It's definitely connected. But what is Shavuot? It's the day of covenant. So, this was the day that Moses went up to the mount and would remain for 40 days and all. But what gets missed is that is not the first day Moses goes up nor is it the day the Ten Commandments and the law were initially given verbally to Moses as he wrote them down and he delivered them to the Israelites verbally days before when he specifically did what? Renewed the covenant first. Exactly how many days before? Exactly three, and we'll prove it. In Exodus 20 through 23, four chapters, Moses provides the Ten Commandments and the law to the people of Israel before the golden calf and before he goes up for the extended period of 40 days as he went up and down several times for a period of days prior. But how many days? Three. And we'll prove it. Exodus 19.1, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Israel, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Again, this says the third month, Sivan, but it does not say which day. No, it does not identify a day, not an exodus. Can one assume it's the first day of Sivan? Only if they have additional support that one can find in another passage or in, say, the Book of Jubilees or something similar. But you will not find such. But we did find support for the exact date. Just not the first. Let's keep reading. 
And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain. This is the same day they came to Sinai, and before the presence of Yahuwah God comes down in the thundering cloud. This is before, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. Renewal here again, just like Noah. Then Ye shall be a particular treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And let us not forget this. No government owns his land, and neither do we. It's his, and he will exercise his ownership, and he's going to take it all back soon. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So what did Moses do? And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. What's Moses doing? He's looking to ratify the covenant, getting the agreement from the people. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Covenant confirmed by all the people. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Covenant ratified and renewed, just as the purpose of Shavuot for Noah and the day of creation where it began. And we saw in the passage earlier that on Mount Sinai, they celebrated Shavuot. So, this is it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. How long? Forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, that's two days, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day, so three days, remember that, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So three days later is when the thundering presence of Yahuwah God comes down to the mountain, and that's when Moses is called up and goes up for the 40 days and receives the two tablets or tables of stone. And what day? And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives, no sex. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. What day was this? This happened according to the book of Jubilees on Sivan 16, when Yahuwah God's presence came down. But what happened three days earlier? The covenant was renewed on Shavuot Pentecost on Sivan 13. So the Pharisees are deceiving with a date of the 6th, but cut them some slack here because they don't even serve YHWH Yahuwah, and they refuse to even use his name, and they had removed him from the Bible, his name, 7,000 times. So they are not only not authorities on the Bible, they are really the opposite, and they serve another God, a different interpretation through the Babylonian Talmud, and they do not represent the original religion of Yahuwah God because he established covenant 
not religion. Relationship, of which the Pharisees don't even call him by name. Knowing him is what matters most. Read Matthew 7. It is the only criteria for salvation. Now take 16, because this was the 16th day that the thundering cloud presence of Yahuwah God came down to Mount Sinai on the 16th of Sivan. Take three days, go three days back, and you are at Sivan 13, the date for Shavuot Pentecost. So this means creation happened on Sivan 13, Shavuot Pentecost, establishing this feast day continuously forever. Perhaps that is the day that Adam was created within the creation cycle. We don't have that specificity, but we do know that creation took place and it was a part of that celebration. It is not new, nor did it pass away. Noah waited to leave the ark and make his offering, renewing the covenant with Yahuwah God on what day? Savan 13, Shavuot Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. Abraham made covenant with Yahuwah God on Shavuot Pentecost, Savan 13. Moses and the Israelites entered covenant relationship with Yahuwah God on Savan 13, Shavuot Pentecost, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us on Savan 13, 3753, or on the Roman calendar, June 2nd, 9 BC. Wow. So, now what? What are we asking you to do? We get that question a lot from our teachings because we uncover things and they there is great revelation sometimes, no doubt. But first, research everything you can on the day of Shavuot Pentecost and understand it and prove this out for yourself. You have work to do. Yes. We aren't addressing Christmas in this video, but you can see clearly it's not one of the seven feast days, and this finding confirms they are all still important today, meaning no matter what you believe in way of pagan origins of Christmas and Easter or whichever, it is not Yahuwah God's day. Anything outside of the seven feast days fall into that category, period. No Christmas nor Easter, which his death and resurrection are tied to the first three festivals, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Yahusha, Jesus, was born on a feast day, Shavuot Pentecost, the day of the covenant for us. Shavuot, and it is time we renew that covenant with him. Now, when you look at the details of how to celebrate this feast, there are rules and there are sacrifices. Some say sacrifices are no longer required without the temple. And we encourage you to research that because Shavuot was celebrated on the day of creation by Noah in the renewal of his covenant with Yahuwah God, and he did not have a temple nor tabernacle. Abraham, too, had no temple or tabernacle, and neither did the Israelites yet on the covenant day in which they sacrificed on Mount Sinai. But we'll leave that as a question for now to deal with later, because as much as we would love to do so. We cannot deal with all topics in each video, one at a time. We will get there, though. We hope you will take this seriously and spend time with Yahuwah God building relationship with Him and pray that you renew your covenant with Him. For us here, in lieu of these findings, which are fresh for us as well, we are going to figure how to follow his words and execute the feast days the way he lays out to the best of our ability. But we are not 
here to tell you what to do, but to share our findings of our research, and the Holy Spirit will guide you. We aren't starting a movement. We aren't starting a church or an organization. We don't ask you for money, ever. You make your decision and draw closer to Him because He loves you and desires relationship with you. Not through your pastor, not through anyone else, not through your spouse. He desires covenant relationship with you, with your family. And on that note, we thank you for watching our Solomon's Gold series. Make sure you are notified by YouTube as we upload new videos by clicking the subscribe button below this video and be sure to click the bell as well. Share this with others and check out our website at thegodculture.com. If you enjoyed this teaching, check out our other videos where we find the Garden of Eden, the home of Adam and Eve, the rivers from Eden, Ophir, Tarshish, Sheba, Jonah's corrected journey, where Noah's Ark landed and it wasn't Turkey, where John the Baptist lived and so much more, all from biblical sources expounded with historical references, science, archaeology, language, geography, and more. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. Yahuwah God bless.